I was making good money, but I was young and stupid and I was spending that money as it was coming. Started a few failed businesses that were, you know, very quickly found myself homeless, living in my own vehicle. I would go stay the night in parking lots of hotels that had free continental breakfast. And I would walk into the mornings, act like I was staying there and eat and get on my laptop and try to look for a job. I think it, it didn't take off because number one, I was young and had no idea how to start a bit and didn't know what direction to go in. I had no mentorship. There's someone I saw who went viral on social media, this guy named Tony did exactly what you guys are doing five dollar deliveries like no bullshit straight five dollar delivery you don't have to tip and he's getting a lot and then uh in 2021 i started traveling with the team so they enjoyed how we work they offered me to be the only american on the entire travel team i travel now with f1 to go to miami mexico city vegas and canada very open and candid with our employees too so we have monthly staff meetings second week of the month we have a zoom staff meeting with all of our employees throughout the state like 150 people. The, how big I, is the Valley Company right now? How many doing the two, 300 cars? Were there ever any moments where you're like, maybe we don't know how to do this? Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Hunter Berkey. He was a sales rep at American Racing, an account manager at First Impressions Valley for brief. Then you started Next Level Valley, where you're currently a partner and most recent venture being Next Level Security, where you're the CEO. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, man. Glad to be here. Let's, uh, let's talk about your journey of how you got to Austin, how did you land your first job, and what, what that entailed. Yeah, for sure. So uh, before coming to Austin, like you said, I was working for American Racing for a little while. Um, I was the youngest inside salesperson in the history of the company. They've been around since like 1956. Yeah. And, um, I was making good money, but I was young and stupid, and I was spending that money as it was coming. And uh, they got bought out by a company called Wheel One. Shortly after that, laid us all off, and um, I didn't have a too good of a future, you know, plan or, or, or strategic, uh, you know, money saving strategy. So I very quickly found myself homeless, living in my own vehicle. I had a nice car, but that's all I had in my name was that, and some clothes in the trunk, and I had a laptop, and. Uh, I would go stay the night in parking lots of hotels that had free continental breakfast. And I would walk in in the mornings, act like I was staying there and eat and get on my laptop and try to look for a job or some kind of, you know, something. And um, started a few failed businesses that were, you know, just we came up with the idea, we came up with the name and, you know, nothing really kind of grew from there. But um, I had a friend of mine, uh, his name's Cooper. He was living here in, in Austin and going to UT at the time. and. Uh, he was like, hey, man, why don't you come to Austin, you know, pretty much hang out, you know, I, I had nothing going on. And uh, that day I got here, uh, he was like, yeah, I, I work as a valet, I can get you a job, and you can sleep on my couch for a little while until you get on your feet. And I met uh, his boss that night, did a two-second interview, and he was like, yeah, you're hired, you know, like, what size shirt do you wear, be, be here tomorrow, you know. Um, so I decided to stay here in Austin, started working as a valet. We were at uh, ADV's V's restaurant in downtown. And it was, uh, it was a cool account. Uh, you know, we were running, though, like five miles a night. You know, it wasn't easy, right? And I, even though I was in the best shape of my life, I started being like, man, I'm, I, I'm, I wouldn't say better than this, but it's like, hey, I, I have more I can offer, right? And uh, with my sales experience and all those kind of things. And um, after, uh, I guess, about a year um, of couch surfing now uh, and not having to live in my car, I finally... You know, started saving money, got my own spot in Austin, right off of uh, um, Slaughter, uh, and, and close to William Cannon over there. And uh, I finally went to my, bo my boss at the time, and I said, hey man, like, if you schedule me ADVs one more time, I'm quitting. <laughs> like, put me at an account that I can run, you know, like, let, like manage, right? Like, let me, let me have some staff under me, let me run the podium. They called it being a captain, is, is like the lead of the site. And he was like, man, I got one restaurant I can put you at, but everybody hates it. And I was like, why, why does everybody hate it? And they're like, the, you know, nobody likes the owner and it's slow. And I was like, I don't give a shit. You know, like, put me over there. You know, like, I'm, I'm fine. You would take the step up for the... Exactly. If, they, if nobody wants it, I'll take it, right? And, and I, I would rather do that than continuing to be where I'm at and just yeah. be another runner yeah. for the Valley Company. That, so I started Parkside. First night I was there, I met the owner, and I had no idea he was even the owner. His name's Sean Serkeel. He's now like, he's like a... We call him the Godfather. He he he's got a lot. His hands in a lot of things now, and he's he's amazing. And uh, at the time, he just had that one restaurant, Parkside. And the first night I worked, I met him, but I didn't know who he was. I thought he was just a chef working there, right? And and he comes out and he's wearing his chef outfit, you know. And I was like, Hey, how you doing, man? And 
uh, Sean's a funny guy. He he just would look at you and he wouldn't say a word, and then he'd look off, and then he'd go back in the restaurant. And I'm like, who is this guy? You know, and come to find out that was the owner that everybody didn't you know didn't like working with. Yeah, all the valets anyway didn't like working with. And uh, so when I found that out, I was like, well, I'm just gonna give right back to him. You know, and and he would come out the where the valet podium was for the restaurant. There was a little side door that was right by their offices. And he would walk out that door and stand there for a minute, look around, look at you, wouldn't say a word, and then he'd go back inside. And I start, started doing the same thing to him. Like, wasn't trying to say hi, wasn't trying to be friendly. I was just like, you're going to do that to me, I'm going to do it to you, right? And we, I think we kind of had a little battle of like, who yeah. was going to talk to each other first or be friendly. Um, and there was a situation that happened that we ended up uh, kind of hitting it off on. And... Uh, and also, I think he started realizing, like, hey, this is our guy. He's here five, six nights a week. We do a good job. I, I had a good relationship with his staff. And um, that I was the, the lead guy down there for, for a couple of years. And uh, I have a, a, a really good friend of mine who's now my business partner. But at the time, he was just a buddy of mine living back in, in the DFW, Fort Worth area. And uh, he was going through something similar, a similar situation that I was a couple of years prior. Yeah. And I gave him the same offer my friend gave me. And I said, you know, hey, why don't you come on down to Austin? You can sleep on my couch. I'll get you a job valeting. You know, we can figure something out. And uh, he was the one, his name's Andis. Um, and him and I were the ones that tried to start up a couple businesses together, yeah. you know. And, and that was, he also, had, he just started up a failed business. And that's kind of where he was at, you know, all, you know, off of his feet, essentially. So he came down. And uh, we had the idea to let's get our real estate license. And Austin's a big real estate market. Let's get our real estate license. We'll, you know, work up to start our own brokerage. And we had these big plans of that. So we're working valet. Um, he's living in my house. Um, I think we eventually we got our own place where he could have a bedroom and yeah. this and that. Uh, but it was a, a few months down the road. And uh, well, Sean ended up opening up another restaurant called Olive in June. And basically, uh, my boss at the time kind of gave me uh, the, the chance. He was like, hey, do you want to stay here at Parkside or do you want to go to Olive in June? And I said, hey, I'm, I'm downtown, man. This is my spot. I know every bar owner over here. I know all the bartenders. Like, downtown's my spot. Give it to Andis. You know, let, let him take it. He's great at what he's doing. So sure enough, they did. They gave Andis Olive in June, and I had Parkside like normal. And... Uh, so Sean's both restaurants were being, you know, ran led by the same valet company. by us two, right? Yeah. yeah, in the same valet company. Well, after a few months of that, uh, essentially him and, and uh, at the time one of his uh, his GMs kind of was coming to us and was saying, "Hey, we want to make a change. We don't like the company you guys work for, but we love you guys. Is there anything y'all can do? Right? Is there any way you yeah. can take over the valet?" And we weren't thinking that at all at that point like that wasn't even on the radar you know and we were thinking about you know getting a real estate business and all kinds of stuff and we looked at it and looked at the numbers and you know finally we're like hey you know we could do this you know and see what happens you know we could still get our real estate license we could still do all that but we could start a valley business it's going to be tough and it's going to be expensive you know but we can do it and we told him i believe we told him six months like hey give us six months and we can get the insurance we need the licensing and you know, all that stuff and he gave us that six months. And there was a lot of stipulations that came with it too. We had to like, we had to lock in, uh, he, you know, cause he was kind of going out on a limb with us. So he made it to where, hey, if I'm gonna go out on a limb with these guys. You got a good deal. They need to prove, number one that, but then they also need to prove that they're on top of their shit. Yeah. And one of the stipulations was there was a parking lot like a block away that was used by a business. And they were strictly just their employees there. They had a gate around it and valet was a no-no there and he was like if you can get that lot i'll sign you a deal and sure enough we we pestered these people we we, we went after them get it in the sense make it available for you guys get to a contract use. with that lot to use for, for valet, valet the cars gotcha, from our restaurant gotcha, okay um i don't think he thought we were really going to get it you know because i think it, i think i think that stipulation was him kind of second guessing why did i give these guys yeah. the opportunity real quick that, that I'm, I'm leaving a, a nation a statewide provider um, that's been in the business for 20, 30 years to go with these two dudes that I like that have never ran a valley business. So I think he was kind of second guessing. So he was like, all right, well, to do this, you guys got to get that lot, right? And and we got it. And nice. so um, thankfully he signed the contracts, we moved forward and we started uh, 
our own valet company at the two restaurants. Uh, in uh, we, the company started in 2012. We, our first day was uh, like the first month of 2013, and it was like a month after that that uh, Uchi kind of came came knocking. And Be- before we talk about the growth of the company, can you quickly mention what are some of your failed businesses? Yeah, yeah. Would you so, would you guys try? Why did they fail? What yeah, did no, you so, realize? Um I guess the first one that uh we it was called HT Customs. Okay. And like I said I was working for American Racing. I had a uh I had a cousin who was working for a place called T&W Sales and they did um body wraps. Well, yeah, they did like audio video, okay. you know, uh fabrications, yeah. customizations, all kinds of things and I was like, "Hey, with these two connections, like I can I can try to start my own, you know, basically aftermarket sales company right so i got a our ein i got account set up and tried to push that a little bit and that that never went off and i, I wouldn't say it ever failed it would never really even kind of got rolling right like it was i had friends and family that would buy for me I, I had a you know every now and then someone in the public would see like a, a sticker on my truck and, and call but it was it was it never took off and then you're saying it didn't took off it didn't take off because you guys weren't able to acquire customers, or like, where where did you guys think you? Uh, I think it, it it didn't take off because number one, it was I was young and had no idea how to start a business, right? And and didn't know what direction to go in. I had no um, help in any kind of mentorship. Okay. I had no um, direction for what it was. And at the time, you know, this was back in you know early two thousands. I mean, technology was different, right? I didn't have a lot of resources to go after and look at unless I wanted to go to the library or something, yeah. you know, and. Um, so I just think just the 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 unfamiliarity yeah. of of starting a business was the reason why that never took off. And then, same thing with our other one. Um, we kind of make a joke. Uh, what made you realize with HD Customs, like why did you guys decide okay it's not working, let's move on? Like was uh, there some signal you guys got or? Man, I don't think there was ever. And see what was also too what what I think's funny is, I think a lot of times businesses are born out of necessity yeah. based off of your your situation right i had a full-time job so this starting this business was it was a cool little project but i didn't need to start the business at the time right i didn't feel that got it you know hey i have to start this or i'm not going to eat you know it's a passion project or a hobby business it was a hobby business it was like hey i got an opportunity here with some with my current position and my relationships i could make some money off of it and i did we made a little money you know but what nothing crazy and and we didn't have that passion i didn't have the passion for the industry Makes number sense. one um and again it, it wasn't a necessity for me to have to have that business Makes right sense. like with with us with next level we kind of and it's funny that when when we started with next level literally there was like a i want to say it was like a week or two before we actually started um before the company that we worked for before we replaced them before anybody kind of knew what was going on um, my business partner and good friend Andis, he accidentally butt dialed our boss at the time while he was talking with Sean about the taking over the valley. Got it. And he was talking about they had a, they were having a conversation about the permits and the insurance and where would we park the cars and this and that. And our boss was like, you know, listening like, what the fuck? Are, what are they talking about? You know. And we figured that out. You know, Andis picked the phone out of his pocket and was like, oh my God, I've been on the phone with Casey for 45 minutes. You know, he heard everything me and Sean were talking about. So we were like, all right, we're about to get fired. You know, like we have to get this going. And then the business, then that company, then offered both of us like at separate times, management positions. They were like, hey, we'll give you a management position. Because yeah. they they knew something was going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't know if that was... That was them trying to retain you and the customer. Either, either trying to retain us and the customer, customer or... Give you a reason not give to. Give us a reason not yeah, to, right? You know, and, and, and we both turned it down, and then we were like, man, we're going to get fired any day now. We have to start this company, you know? Yeah. So that that was a little different circumstance than HD Customs, right? And then the same thing with our other business that, quote, unquote, failed. It, it was a, kind of the same situation. We didn't get, really get rolling. We didn't really have a set plan. But we make a joke that we started uh, Favor and Uber Eats yeah, and DoorDash yeah, yeah. before smartphones. It was called GoTo Guys. And uh, we made the, it was just Andis and I, and we made these little flyers, real cool. And, and uh, it was like, you know, anything you need. Your groceries picked up, your yard done, you know, your leaves <laughs> raked, you know, your house clean. We're the go-to guys, you know, and we pass those out. And um, 
uh, real rich neighborhoods yeah. and retirement communities and we had a good little pop there for a little while and then I, we I think we got I think the end of that was we got a few big like uh, landscaping jobs and we had no idea what we were doing with landscaping right and hey, we didn't even, make it we didn't even think about like outsourcing and finding crew like we just were like yeah we'll do it you know and we had one big job and finally we were just like I don't want to do this anymore <laughs> you know like we need to we need to hire people it's a great idea we need to hire people you know and and at the time again we had no idea what we were doing it wasn't a necessity for us so we kind of slowed down what's funny though is a couple years ago we bought the domain for go to guys okay so we have go to guys.com is it go to or go to uh, i can't remember how it is on the domain i think it's just go to okay uh, go to guys nothing's there's no side associated yeah, yeah. with it but we bought the domain because i was like hey maybe one of these days we can start that back up you know and and, and go from there but um it's funny you say that there's someone i saw who went viral on social media i don't remember if it's sf or seattle one of the mm -hmm. well, um maybe LA, one of these three uh, cities, this guy named Tony did exactly what you guys were doing with GoTo guys. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, within his area, like Tony's area, yeah. $5 deliveries. Like, yeah. like no bullshit, like straight $5 delivery. Yeah. You don't have to tip. Yeah. And, a kill. He's, and he's getting a lot of like, yeah. it's also part of the like, oh, let's, you know, do this. Yeah. Or the like, right. virality of it. But it's also, he's locked down that area in terms yeah. of like, if people know about him, they'll most likely call him for dinner. Yeah, right. no, that's awesome, man. I mean, it's 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 funny what you can do, but yeah. So, um, I think if we were to be in the situation to put some time and effort into those businesses now, um, it'd be a little different, you know. And I think maybe one day with at least the go-to guy side of it, maybe we will, you know. Yeah. But uh, we got our hands full of what we're going in with anyway. <laughs> nice. So you guys are deciding to start. How do you even go about knowing what's needed to start a valet business? Man, so we did a lot of we did a lot of research. Um, because exactly being a being um, captains, mm -hmm. you guys know how to run the business, right. but not necessarily. Hey, I need this insurance, this type of this legality. That right. like, you know, what happens if a car crash? Whatever. Exactly. Right? Yeah, we we know we know how to run. We know how to work in the business. We don't know how to work on the business, right? That, at that point, it was all. Brand new. We didn't realize how much insurance cost was. We didn't realize how much tickets, you know, the paper tickets to yeah. rip were. We didn't didn't realize how much podiums were and uniforms and payroll costs and taxes and what all these things are. So we had to do research, you know. And luckily, um, before Andis moved to Austin, he just got done kind of failing. It, not not because of him, but he opened a smoke shop in uh, Mansfield, Texas, and. Um, he had a, a guy that kind of basically approached him and said, hey, you can open up a smoke shop in my building, this and this and that. And he kind of mentored him in the things that were needed to get a business rolling. Well, then the city, like, changed up a bunch of ordinances and they had to shut the business down, right? But that experience Got helped us with starting the valet company because he was like, well, I know we need this and I know we need this and I know we need this. And then... Um, were you guys never scared about what if we miss something? And yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, we're you know, and and we did. You know, there was there was times at the beginning where we missed the things, and I mean, and there's there's you know problems and issues that came up, and it's like holy shit, you know, what are we, what are we gonna do now? But, you know, that's even that's sometimes those those feelings and thoughts happen now, and we have yeah. very successful businesses, and it's like sometimes you're like holy shit, because not every day is gonna be sunshine and rainbows. You know, there's there's a lot of not a lot, thankfully, but there's days that there's problems and there's chaos and there's issues and there's things that we've never dealt with in our 12 years of running a business now. And it's like, it's, it's, it's new ways to, um, you know, new ways to panic, essentially, yeah. but you gotta, you gotta embrace those things. And, and we've, we've come to be very good at that to where it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm at a point now where I embrace problems because every time we've had a big problem with our business, we've you've, turned that into, you've come out ahead. At the, yeah. And, and, and we've been fortunate with it, but you know, there was, there was a lot of time. I mean, with the uh, with COVID is a good example. COVID it was the only reason that security is where it is now, and we were shut down for seven months, and we had to kind of reevaluate and be like, what can we do to make money? And we found another. Like there was option. a need. Yeah, there and we need. we found another option, and then you know that option, uh, and we can get into it here in a minute. But that option stopped after a couple of years, and we had to find another oh, yeah. route to go into. So I mean. You know, and if all those things wouldn't have happened, if these big massive problems at the time wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't be where we are right now. And and so I've I've come to embrace the problems. You know, and and I I forgot who says it. And I saw it was a great quote. 
Um, but the guy was basically saying, like, instead of, like, poor me and poor us, like, hey, poor everybody else because we're going to be able to take care of this, but they won't, right? And, and I love that, and I, and I li we live by that, you know, and um, I try to get our team to, to believe in that, right? Like, I've had phone calls where it's like, hey, you know, like, give you an example, and, and I know I'm kind of jumping ahead yeah, here, yeah. but um, so in September of uh, 2021, you know, at the time we were rolling really heavy with construction site security and the bulk of our revenue was construction site security. And unfortunately at the time, the bulk of that revenue was coming from one client, right? We had all our eggs essentially in one basket and they were a great client. We, we still work with them to this day. Um, but they called me up, you know, on like a Thursday and um, we're just like, hey, bad news. Nobody's buying houses right now. Um, we're going to have to pause security for at least the next six months. We're going to go with a cheaper option, get cameras out here. Um, so sorry, you know, and, and that was, like I said, 90 plus percent of our revenue, you know. So that one phone call shut up, you almost could have shut us down. Right. And I had to have a, a mini freak out to myself in my office for 30 minutes and just be like, what the fuck, what are we going to do? But then I had to be like, nope, this is good. Right. I'm, I'm going to a first, let me convince myself of why. And then B let me sh sh sell that dream to my team, right? Um, and it was like, hey, we, we're gonna we're gonna reevaluate. We're gonna start looking into other options that we can do, other avenues that we can do. We now know we don't we we do not need to lock up with just one client. We need to diversify essentially and find other businesses, go with more builders, um, find other avenues of the business, and then also we need to start gearing up and planning for you know these type of situations like. If people aren't buying houses, then we need to expect the construction side to be slow, right? And the next time we have this phone call, you know, once they start back with us up in six months, because we, we, we're telling ourselves we know they will, right? We got six months of hard times, but we know it's going to get back and, and going good. When they make that call again in September, this won't be a problem, right? And we had to make that shift mentally and, and actually, you know, physically into the business. And Thankfully, we did, you know, and, and then when we got, sure enough, like clockwork, we got that phone call again at the end of the year, the next year, and they're like, yeah, we're going to take another pause till the spring, and it's like, no problem, we're good, you know, like, totally fine, thanks for letting us know, we'll see you guys in the spring, and, um, you know, those kind of things spawned into us doing the licensing and the training and the online store, and that yeah. would have never happened if we were, things were sunshine and rainbows with construction, for, you know, from there to now, you know what I'm I mean? Just thinking a lot, I'm just curious if there's creative ways to structure a deal with a construction company mm -hmm. where you're with them the whole year, mm -hmm. but there's some ebbs and flow so that you're not cutting off revenue, but I don't, I'm just thinking. Yeah, no, and that's yeah. a good, that's a good call. And, and you know, construction is weird, man. It's like, number one, all these builders are super tight, right? Like they're, they're, they're very tight, which, you know, you have to be to be successful in business, but when you say tight, you mean just from a P and L perspective of yeah. like super cost. Super, co yeah, and and we are a very large cost when it comes yeah. to construction. Yeah. I mean, but it's even more of a cost if you don't have it, right? Yeah. Because when we started with this one builder, they were telling us how, you know, yeah, we're losing twenty thousand dollars a day out here because we don't have security and things are getting stolen and jobs are getting delayed and, um, so they're like, well, we're, we'd gladly pay you guys, you know, twenty grand a month per location as opposed to losing twenty grand a day and. Um, so like the, it, it, it's definitely a great business, right? right? With the construction side of things, but there's, there's only so much we can do. Like they, they bitch if we overbill, you know, an hour or if we pre-bill a, a, a week or whatever, you know? So, um, it is what it is, yeah, but yeah. you know, but that, I like, I like the idea of setting up like a year long contract kind of deal, yeah, yeah. but that's, that in itself is kind of tough too, because, no, yeah, 100%, 100%. you know, a lot of times they have last minute needs. Hey, we need can you add some guys over here during the day or, you know, Hey, we're, we're, we're taking off. We need now 24 hour coverage over the next three days. Like there's always changes, you know? And, yeah. um, so that would be, that, uh, that would be a, that would be a, a situation yeah. to kind of yeah. look into for sure. Sweet. So you guys going back to your journey, have the offer to start a valet company or figuring shit out. You start it, you land the lot across, um, Eddie V's and now, what's your guys's progress right how do you go from that to so we, scaling and yeah for it? sure so at the time i mean it was a grind man we were you know all night working the valet and all day working on the business right trying to figure out cost and go over numbers and 
you know, we were saving a lot of payroll costs with us working the account seven nights a week, but we knew that's that's not sustainable, yeah. and we can't grow like that. Right? Exactly. And so, you know, we had to start getting into, you know, the hiring of more employees. And, and you know, when we started, we had a couple guys come on board with us from the old, old company that knew the deal. And um, that was... Trustworthy, like you don't have... Yeah, one of them was like, and this is brother that worked for us already for the valet. And one of them was my brother. They both still work for the company to this day. Um, but, you know, we were able to add on a couple of people that, um, but starting to, you know, to, to like delegate essentially and say, you know, Hey, I'm going to give you the opportunity to run the account one night or, you know, be our main guy here. That took a lot. Cause it was like, all right, you know, this is, we started this, we know the numbers like the back of our hand. We are the reason we're here essentially. And if they do something wrong, it still comes back to you. It comes back so, on us, yeah. but it's like you got to replicate what we're doing. Yeah, here. Yeah. And that was tough, you know, and that was tough to even trust them to do that, right, and find the right people. So we were fortunate that that was going in the right direction. Um, but when uh, when we got introduced with Uchi, you know, we knew who they were, and, and uh, every now and then up until that point, like, I would work Uchi here and there, like on a, on a, I'd pick up a shift or, you know, Andis would do the same thing, pick up a shift to work over there. So we, we knew Uchi, we knew how busy it was. We knew the, the, um, you know, their reputation in the city for being, you know, one of the best restaurants in town and, and in the state. And at the time they only had Uchi and Uchi Co in Austin and then a Uchi in Houston. And a guy named John Badell, he at the time was, I believe just the uh, director of operations. Now he's like the president, lives in Miami, gets mailbox money like he doesn't do anything right he doesn't not do anything but he's he's earned his where he's yeah. but at the time he was uh, just director of operations running those restaurants and he pulled he would he would be a regular at parkside a couple times a week and one day he pulls up and he, he him and i knew each other but we didn't know each other more than just like hey how you doing john good to see you and then i knew what he was over there and he knew i was the violet at parkside and uh, he pulled up and he saw we had red our, our colors were red at the time and first impressions were blue and he and they use first impressions too and when he pulled up the park site he's like oh new uniforms i was like oh new, new company and he was like what do you mean and i was like yeah we, we started our own company we took over parkside and all of in june and he's like really and uh, i was like yes sir you know and he was like gave me a card he's like we need to talk you know we need to start talking so that turned into about nine months of once a month or so we'd have a meeting with uchi and they would go over our podiums and go over our process and go over our hospitality uh, training and go over our handbook and just made sure and vetted us for almost nine months right and, and towards the end of that nine months they were like hey we want you guys to take over our restaurants but there's a kicker if you take over uchi and uchiko here in austin you have to take over houston on the same day and we never even went there before we were like all right you know we're gonna go check it out tonight and uh he was like gonna go go to restaurant tonight like, yeah we're gonna go right now we're gonna leave this office and we're gonna drive to houston and we're gonna check out uchi you know and see what see what's see what it's all about and he got us hooked up with you know a, a good a good discount for the for our meal and he's like make sure you go have dinner i'll let everybody know so we drove to houston and um give an example a busy night for us at that time for these restaurants here 80, uh, 80 cars 70 cars. that was crazy busy literally, literally like regular busy was like 30 40 50 okay, cars yeah. it was a normal busy night and we, the uchi it doesn't have really have a big lot so like no yeah you're not really running back and forth right yeah. well what i'm so i'm talking about before we even started with uchi right parkside and all of in june a busy night for us was 30 40 yeah. maybe 50 cars and we knew uchi parked you know a little bit more than that you know the ones here in, in austin but we had no idea about houston and so we drove to houston that day and start just kind of infiltrating things and chatting with the valets like we're hey man how many cars you park and this and that you know they had no idea who we were and the guy uh, the lead guy there was like oh man we park like two three hundred cars a night we we're like what you know like this is humongous you know and they had six lots spread out throughout this how area. many people do you need for that volume oh man i mean that on a regular night i mean six to eight valets on site okay. that's just on a shift and that's not including you know seven days a week yeah, staffing yeah. that right so that in itself was a monster but we told we came back and and told john beta we said yeah we can do it you know like we'll figure it out and luckily for us they trusted us we started on uh, january 2nd of 2014 um at all three locations all uh, uchi uchiko and then uchi houston and what we did was we got an apartment in houston we moved one of our guys from Austin, one of our really good guys that was with us for, you know, uh, 
they, they actually switched from first impressions to us and then you promoted them and then we promoted them and moved them to houston their their family was from there so it made sense and it was perfect at the time so we moved him uh and we got him into a two-bedroom apartment and we said hey the other bedroom is going to be andis and i's we're going to split time you live here full time we'll split rent and then every other month andis or i will be here to oversee help with the hiring just be here um and that other bedroom will be ours right and we did that that's kind of how we, we operated for, like, I want to say at least a year. You know, like, I'd be there for a month, and then Anus would be there for a month. And then, you know, we we, we worked kind of back how we were when we first started. It was like, hey, we're at the valet podium all night, and then we're working on the business all during the day, you know. And that was a blast. Like, it was so fun getting it going and seeing it grow. And it was, you know, more volume than we've ever seen, right, like from going from two restaurants to all of a sudden now five restaurants and the three that we added were monsters, you know, so it was, it was a whole thing. And they, uh, you know, with Uchi and kind of the whole talks, you know, we, we saw how successful they were and how busy they were and their, their reputation. And we knew going into it that they were talking about you know, multiple expansions, multiple, um, other opportunities, other restaurants, you know, with Loro and Uchi Ba and all these things, other concepts. So, as they grew, we got to grow with them. You know, we got to expand within Dallas. We expanded within the Denver. We expanded with them in the other restaurants that needed it. Not all their concepts need valet. You know, Loro doesn't, and it, it, the one here in Austin for sure doesn't. We were at the Loro in Houston for a little while. I believe we're still there. Like I said, Andis runs the valet side, but I believe we're still there. And then we have uh, um, Uchi Ba in Dallas. They're opening up an Uchi Ba here, I believe. Uchi Ba here is open. Already. It's open. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, yeah. So and uh, so it's that was a great client, right? And, and that was a, that was something that we could have never expected. And if we wouldn't have ever gotten Uchi, we would have never opened the security company. Yeah. And that's that's kind of how we started with them too. And and so, what's one thing? So we were talking about this the other day. You you have this f- fake it till you make it mentality, which mm-hmm. is I think a good naivety to have right. but like when scaling a business when going doing the two three hundred cars were there ever any moments where you're like maybe maybe we don't know how to do this and like did you ever feel like you took on too much too fast no man uh you know uh, fortunately never had that mentality about it definitely had freak out moments where it's like holy shit what are we gonna do but there was never an option of throwing in the towel yes. there was never an option of you know, hey, we, we bit off more than we can chew. We can't do this. It was just like, all right, we have to figure this out. You know, we got to make this work, right? We, and, and, and Anis and I are very confident with not only like ourselves, but with our business and, and what we're trying to do. And we both have that same mentality where it's like, no, we're going to do it. You know, let's, let's figure this out. This sucks, right? This, this might be an issue. Now we know, but we got to figure this out right now, you know? And, and we've been fortunate that to have that mentality, but then also we've we've come out of every you know situation that would you know present that type of thought process we've come out of all that in positive you know um and if there's any negatives now then like there you know like i said there still is every now and then it's a learning opportunity right it's not it's not a failure it's like hey all right now we know let's get better tomorrow you know and and have that same mentality every single day you can't lose you know how do you guys think about so you go from being in your car, being a valet, to now running your own valet company, right? Mm-hmm. How do you guys think about taking money out of the company, reinvesting in growth, scaling, you know, doing good for your employees? How do you guys think about that um, decision when, you know, looking at P&L statements and say, okay, business is doing well. Do we, you know, take dividends, take take a bigger salary, or do we put it back, grow, and try to, you know, go to another region, hire more people, hire right. a restaurant? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, you know, we kind of look at it in, in both ways, right? Like, you know, A, obviously everyone, you work to make money, right? And so, yes, we're doing this to make money and how can we pay ourselves more? But almost equally as important is taking care of our employees, taking care of the business because, and a lot of companies don't get this, the ones that do are the usually the successful ones, but we, no matter what Andis and I do, no matter what, how hard I work or how, what I feel or, you know, what my mentality is, we wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have good people working yeah. for us. Right. And if these people didn't have the opportunities they have and didn't like working for us and didn't, didn't enjoy the company, we would be shit. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be where we are, you know? So we saw from 
it's another kind of good thing with us is like, you know, we saw firsthand, which most people do, but we saw firsthand, like how it feels to bust your ass for a company, how it feels to be the reason why this restaurant's even working with you and getting nothing out of that. Yeah. Right. No bonus, no added hourly, no even good job, you yeah. know, and, and that, that makes people feel a certain way. And, you know, we kind of make not jokes, but we kind of talk about it like, you know, Hey, if they were made, if they would have maybe treated us different, back then and and showed us the love and stuff that we felt like we should we should have gotten as an employee we might have never opened the valley yeah. business you know we might have been like oh no man you know we're doing our own thing we're, we're not gonna do that to these guys you know they, they take care of us and you know thankfully they didn't <laughs> so that's that's why we were okay with the decision but yeah man we we, we take it very serious to treat our guys good man we do employee of the month we yeah. Uh, we pay an industry high for the valet and security. Um, we we take care of our people, man. We you know we do payroll advances. We have all kinds of projects and deals that we help out with our people. We give them, uh, especially with like the security side, and we're about to start doing with the valet side, um, turning everyone into ambassadors. So it's like you get a discount code, um, you or you get a uh, you get a, a code essentially that you can kind of sell if you want to people. They get a discount. A of... Yeah, they get a discount for this through the site or through the training, and you get paid for it. You know, we we have little cool little opportunities for that. We get um, you're basically making them your advocates, right? So and allowing them to be able to make more money. You know what I mean? And and um, so just little little things like that. We we do all the time. You know, and and you know we had a kind of a like a, a contest for uh, uh, like designs. We were like, hey, you know, we got the online store. We're getting rolling. We're willing to do a. a you know, a design contest. You come to us with a design that we can add to shirts or hats or whatever that we like. If we pick something, we'll we'll give you you know a a a, a bonus cash yeah. up front, and then maybe we'll lock something in where you get percentage of the revenue forever off off this thing or whatever. Yeah. You know, and um, we're actually in the middle of that right now. We haven't nice. we haven't picked the winner of, of who that's going to be, but yeah, just stuff like that, man. We we got to take care of your employees. Or the, you know, they're the lifeblood of your business. 100%. You know, they're the they're the they're the wheel that. Um, you know, the how drivers. big is the Valley Company right now? How many folks? Uh, it's big, man. They uh, we're rolling with I think 150 plus. Both companies have about 150 plus okay. each. Pretty cool. Um, and that includes like core staff plus you know folks who are actual. Yeah, I'm assuming there's more churn on that side, right? Like, oh yeah, churn. Valley's way more churn. Because I mean, we were just having this conversation yesterday. But Valley side, outside of management, you know, it's typically a younger man's job. It, it's looked it's looked at Get like part time. It's looked at like while you're going through school. And that's what it is, you know, and, and um, so the turnover's a lot higher for valet, but not negatively, right? It's not like turnover's high because guys are quitting all the time because they hate working for us. It's like, summer, summer's over, they're going back to school or, you know, whatever it is. It's like always an in-between thing. Like, yeah, for the Very most few people are... Very few turn into a career, right? Yeah, yeah. And and uh, with security, it's a lot different. And if they do, they become management. They're not... Exactly, like, you right. know, and, you know, and they get it, you know, as we grow, that opens up obviously more opportunities for management positions and stuff, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not as prevalent as an obvious situation, you know, for that from a valet side. With security, it's a little different. You know, there's a... It security's looked at more like you can. Hey, I can make this a career, right? Not only do they pay great, but like I can lock this into a forty-hour-a-week job. And you know, with us and some of the contracts we have, it's like, hey, you know, like I can make this a career. You know, and we have a super low turnover with with security. I mean, literally, the only people that ever don't work for us anymore either we terminate them or like you know something happens and they have to move or whatever. You know, we. Very, very rarely have people quit. We very, very rarely have to fire people. Um, you know, it's it's we've been very fortunate with with uh, finding good people. And as we grow and as we have you know certain opportunities for these guys, word kind of gets out that you know, hey, you want to work for next level. And so we start getting like the best of the industry, yeah. not only applying with us, but you know being onboarded and added and um, makes our lives a lot easier. You know what I mean? The very uh out of the ballpark question so i come from like a SaaS tech world right like so i th i think a lot in metrics kpis i'm just curious on a per location basis what do you guys look at to see whether that team is doing well and operating well and efficiently in regards to both or like valet no for industry? valet for valet, for valet? Yeah, yeah. um there's a few metrics that they do and they're following a lot of it right now um and they're adding a lot of it but uh so the first one that I can think of is uh, they do get, like guest they associate guest reviews okay. with the employee, right? 
and they're working out um so like employee bios that show like that keeps track automatically of their rating associated yeah, with got with it. you know clients ratings um we also look at uh tip averages what's the average what's the tip average per shift that you work is it three dollars a night is it eight dollars a night is it ten dollars a night is it four dollars a night higher the tip average obviously it shows like hey you guys are on top of your shit yeah. you know like you're doing good you're getting tipped out well you guys are on top of it and then it's um how many cars we park per hour right so there's a lot of metrics that go into yeah. that like how many cars we're parking per hour what's the revenue per hour there's there's a handful of ways that they track it um so after you know after some time you can sit back and look at it and say okay hey i see this guy his numbers are all high and everything across the board and this guy is low everywhere across the board like we're not going to have him running the count anymore you know so um takes a little bit of time but the metrics are there for us to kind of keep track of that you know and um right. which i think is great you know and it makes things easier with security you know the only real way we track if a guy's doing well with security is our reporting so our for the most part every single account we have um they're drafting and, and submitting reports either Got on it. an hourly basis or on a uh, every time they do a, 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 a round, like do a foot patrol or, you know, they do beginning of shift reports, end of shift reports, incident reports. Nice. Um, they can file formal complaints. They can file informative reports. Like, so every day we get at nine o'clock in the morning from every single one of our accounts, we get a report and we can track that and look nice. at it. And it, you know, shows where they are in the area. It shows if they're Jeep, you know, if they weren't doing an activity report during a certain amount of time we can be like, hey why didn't you do a report for this time or this time like we can track that way um but there's no data other than that for us to look at and say hey, he's, he's doing good it's literally just them right. reporting and feedback from our clients and staff you know and we're fortunate that it's gotten to a situation or to a position now to where our guys get like our guys especially all the guys downtown here in austin that work like the the prop b enforcement um they all kind of take ownership of what we're doing. So if a guy is not doing what he's supposed to do or not pulling his weight or they feel like doesn't make us look good as a whole, that's brought to our attention. Nice. And, and it's like, hey, so-and-so showed up with dirty-ass boots yesterday or, you know, this guy showed up with a wrinkled shirt. You know, we, we, we need to be on top of that. And like little things like that, and it's like that shows ownership. You know, you're, you're worried about the business looking good because that represents you. Yeah. And you have a full time career here, so they they take the ownership. You don't want to also risk the potential opportunity, right? Like 100%. let's say one guy messes something up. If it leads to the account being terminated, that most likely exactly. means that you're also out of a job for the time being. And, right? and you know, and we're and we're very open and candid with our employees too. So we have monthly staff meetings. Uh, so on the security side, I know Valley does it too. I can't really speak on their meetings. I'm not in any of those. <laughs> Thank Me, God. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm in the monthly staff meetings we have for security. Every single month. Second week of the month, we have a Zoom staff meeting with all of our employees throughout the state. Like 150 people. So not all of them show on. Like, yeah, yeah. We have, so we have 150 employees. I'd say about 50 of those are 1099 event staffers that just we work for okay. events. Got it, got it. So we don't put those on the Makes monthly sense. staff call. Okay. Sometimes we do. Like if we have a big event coming up or um, a big event season coming up or whatever it is, we might schedule those for these staff meetings. Um, and they're paid staff meetings too. That kind of makes it towards nice. like, yeah, hey, yeah, okay. go ahead and hop on, you know. Um, but for the most part, we have all of our W-2s on, right? But so we have, uh, so we have the monthly staff meetings and, and we'll go over any updates in the company, any things that we need to touch on. And then, you know, we're completely candid about things like, Hey guys, here's what we're trying to do now. We're going to try to expand to this area. This is who we're talking with. Yeah. Here's this contract we might be locking up. Here's what we're doing next. Yada, yada. So keeping them involved and understanding. So they're aware. Exactly. Keeping them involved, understanding where the business is going that breeds that ownership, you know, and it and it's it's made it's made that side of it way more easier nice. for sure. So, how do you go from owning a valet company to now also starting a security company? What happened there? Yeah, so uh, we started the security in Houston, and it was from Uchi Houston, and uh, they had a Uchi hired a a one man show type of security team. It was one guy and he hired like three dudes and it was, they were there every single night and they had to be there. It was security was a necessity because I mean, they're parking all those cars and there were multiple lots spread out throughout the area that, you know, Valley doesn't have eyes on them at all times. It was an area. It's on, uh, like Montrose and Westheimer, which is like notorious for like car break-ins and all that okay. stuff, that whole area. So it was a, it was a, it was a problem that they needed to have security there. And um, I became friends with the owner 
of the company. And then, like I said, he was owner operator. He was there almost every night. Really cool guy. He was ex uh, ex HPD. His name was Clyde. I called him Big Casino. And uh, me and him were buddies. Every time I'd come to Houston, we'd go out to du- go out to lunch, get dinner. Um, every now and then, go out and get drinks. Like you know, we, when I was on the site, we'd hang out and talk. Like he was a good dude. We we became pals. Um, well, he got into some issues, some family issues that he had to kind of step away from the business for a little bit. And during that time, like he kind of asked me, he's like, "Hey, Hunter, can you help? You know, kind of run things while I'm gone." And I was absolutely like, yeah, not only because he was my friend, but it's like, we need security here. You yeah. know, like, this needs to go well. Like, or we, it, you know, messes our stuff up. So I helped run the business for like- Also three adds liability to yours. Yeah, stuff. you know, it's like, hey, hell yeah, I'll help you because I need it. You know, like we need it out here. So for about three months, I was running his business. I hired a, a, another guy to kind of replace him. I was on top of the scheduling, the top of the payroll, on top of making sure the billing was going to Uchi. But they had no idea it was me running it. They thought it was- the same company yeah. that they hired. Well, after about three months of that, Clyde came to me and was like, hey, owner, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to come back. You know, I'm going to have to walk away. I'm done. You know, do whatever you got to do. You know, I appreciate your help, but I'm not going to be able to come back. So I talked with Anis, and it was, security is 100% my idea, and, and Anis 100% had my back on it. But I was like, hey, we could, if Uchi says yes, we should approach them about us opening a security company because we can piggyback on with the valet. We were doing a lot of events. We're doing even more now. We were doing a lot of events at the time. And, you know, a lot of events that we did valet for, there was security there, right? It was an event. And I was like, man, if we get a security company, we can sell both services and this and this and that. And I just liked the idea. And um, so I went to Uchi and basically said, look, you guys got two options, man. And I, I remember calling John Badell about it. And I said, you guys either need to hire another security company right now because Clyde's not coming back. Yeah. I don't know if he told you guys, but he's done. Or you trust us. I've been running the business for the last three months. I know what's needed out here. We can start up a whole new LLC, get our insurance, get everything taken care of, and we'll be your guys. And they were like, "Yeah, let's go with you guys." You know, no, no brainer, right? Thankfully, they did, and that took a little, that took a little bit of going. And, and it's, uh, it's funny. Like, so the state of Texas, it's they make opening up a private security company pretty hard. You have to have certain stipulations, and you have to have certain experiences, and so we had to kind of work around that a little bit and hire some people that met those requirements and put them in certain places to, to get these licenses. And, um, you know, had some contracts that were going to end on a certain date. So, uh, so certain people could step in. Um, but, uh, so we, we did, we signed up and we had that one account. We had it only going at, uh, Uchi Houston. And then we would piggyback off a few events, um, here and there in Houston and Austin. Word started getting out up here in Austin about, our security side because we had already kind of our a big, a big foot in the door with the valet and we started really rolling with good events and getting our name out there and we started kind of becoming the go-to for the valet side of the events so when we got to add security we already had a lot of clientele that were like oh hell yeah y'all do security now too like done deal you know let's let's hire you guys and two for one right yeah you know it makes it easier and and you know from that relationship too we were able to uh you know, in 2018, we started working uh, Formula One with security. And um, up to that time... How many guys do you need for that? So at the time, not that many. They now, they've they've ramped up our, yeah. our staffing requirements, you know, a bunch since then. But at the time, it was like, if I remember right, our first year uh, was like four or five guys a day around the clock. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday was like 10 or 15, like nothing crazy. Still a lot, right? It was more than we've ever had to deal with. And you're the only security on the lot, or no, no, no. So we only deal with the, uh, and we to to this day we only uh, deal with the suites, like the paddock. They got it, got it. So we only work in the paddock club, which is like where the suites are, the racing teams, yeah. the the pit the pit crew area on the bottom. Yeah. Like we don't deal with the parking lot security yeah. or any of that stuff. We're we're just on the paddock. We're the we're the we're the cool ones, you know. <laughs> um, but so they we got introduced to the security team that does every Formula One race through a valet event client of ours. Nice. And it's this guy, his name's Dylan, super cool dude, and uh, I love his family, and um, he's a Ferrari uh, collector. He's got like nice. 19 Ferraris or something, guys out of control. Um, but he was big into Formula One, and he got us a job working uh, as parking attendants in one of the parking lots out there during F1. Well, once he found out that we have a security business now, he got uh, basically us in front of the people that make the decisions for the local security company to work Formula yeah. One. 
And they introduced us to a company that's uh, called RAD, R-A-D, and they're out of Germany, and out of Cologne, out of Cologne, Germany. And they travel every single one of the races. Well, what they do is when they go into other countries or whatever, they hire a local team to provide security to uh, meet the licensing requirements that are needed. And the they're like in charge, but like they're operating through right. And they the local. And, and they got a bunch of their team there. We're we're just additional help, right? Yeah. So it saves them some money flying all their dudes over from Germany. They meet the licensing requirements yeah. from an insurance standpoint, and they, you know, they have staff to work for them, yeah. right? So it's it's a good deal for them, very smart. And they introduced us to them. They gave us the opportunity in 2018, and we did our first year. Um, they said, "Hey, you guys did great. We're going to continue to hire you guys on, and next year we're going to ramp it up." And then it went from like you know four a day to eight a day to ten a day to you know 40 now we're doing 45 guys a day friday saturday sunday nice um and 10 24 hours a day monday through thursday um and then uh in 2021 i started traveling with the team so um they enjoyed how we worked they enjoyed how i ran our team and, and enjoyed working with me and they offered me uh to be the only american on the entire travel team nice. roster um, so I travel now with F1 to go to Miami, Mexico City, Vegas, and Canada. Nice. And then we're the local team in Austin. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the – I know we kind of went off on the formula yeah, thing. Yeah. But, so that's how the security kind of started. Nice. And then it was really just kind of a – you know, we had some big big events, like I said, Formula One and stuff. But for the most part, we, it was nothing. We had a, It was a small little security business. You know, we, we had a handful of events here and there and one account in Houston, you know. Um, and then COVID hit. And both businesses were shut down for you know seven months. We had zero dollars coming in. Security kind of did. There was a there was a couple clients that here and there would be like, hey, we need somebody overnight. You know, when everything was shut down, you know, that we're like, we need somebody there to make sure people aren't breaking into our stuff. So we had a couple little bit coming Small in gigs, here, but and nothing there. big enough. Nothing yeah. big, man. I mean, nothing that we could be sustainable on. But we started looking at it. We're like, what's something, anything at all that we can do to make money with these businesses, or do we need to figure something else out? Right? Do we need to close shop on both these and figure something else out and so you guys are both like partners in both businesses or how how's that structure i'm 90 10 with val uh, 90 10 with security he's uh, 90 10 with valet. nice okay yeah so at the time but at the time we were 50 50 valet and 50 50 security because we, we just that's why we did so by that time so we said hey well, what's going on that we can make money at at all and we got the idea of construction security construction was still going on during covid sure they needed security that's a thing but we had no idea we didn't know anything about construction security um so we started hitting the block on that and calling every builder reaching out to every home builder reaching out to every construction company um trying to get our name out there to, to supply a quote and i think it was like a wednesday or a thursday uh we we were on the phone with milestone uh, milestone uh, community home builders and, and we're, they're still a client to this day but um i was on the phone with him it was wednesday or thursday it was a guy named joe and he goes, yeah, actually, you know what? We do need new security. We, we just uh, replaced uh, the guys this week. Can you be in five neighborhoods on Monday? And I was like, oh, shit. You know, like, yeah, of course we can. You know, no problem. Send me the addresses. We'll get it taken care of. And I had to, we had to scramble, you know, the, that rest of the week and the weekend to fill those positions. Thankfully, we did. We got them all covered. And those five neighborhoods turned into 10. The 10 turned into 15. The 15 turned into a couple more builders. And, um you know, that's how security kind of started taking off and, and being its own big deal. And right around the time we started, like literally, like I think the week or two into the doing construction, um, Andis and I were like, hey, one of us has to run security, one of us has to run valet, or this isn't going to work. You know, we can't, we can't both be in this and, 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 and trying to grow both businesses. It only makes sense for us to focus and it'll, it'll benefit. So naturally, he took the valet, I took the security, and it was the best decision we ever made because we were – we we love each other everyone always says like don't go to business with a friend or whatever yeah, yeah. we're fortunate that, that was never an issue right like we we always kind of had the same dreams the same goals we work really really well together yeah. we think a lot a lot alike um but you know there's still those issues of stepping on toes sometimes yeah, yeah. or hey i i like this and we had to kind of butt heads on certain things we're doing this number one alleviated that yeah. right and it made it to where i'm more of a um uh, consultant for the valet and I can help with ideas and this and that and vice versa with security but we run our own show nice. he runs the valet I run the security nice. um, but we benefit each other you know it's it's such a better much much better beneficial relationship yeah um, than it was when we were 50 50 um, 
And then, you know, with, with the security side, you know, I was fortunate to end up adding some really good back of the house pieces um, that helped me grow, um, that I can lean on. And, and they, you know, I, they got the same mindset as us. So, um, yeah, things that's that's kind of how security has been rolled. Nice. I like yeah. that. What's next in terms of scaling the company for you? How what are you thinking about for the next two to five years? Well, we just became the uh, first and only private security company hired by the governor of Texas. Yeah. And um, so we now have our licensing to do government contracts. And we had a meeting yesterday, actually, with the guy who's going to um, who's in that realm. So we're going to start going after a little bit more government contracts, nice. we're feeling. Um, but what's for sure coming um, within the next two weeks, our website will be completely done to where you can go to our website. You can. Um, pay and take licensing classes online. So you can get your level two, which is unarmed. You can get your level three, which is armed. You can schedule the, the range time to get your licensing. Um, you can schedule level four classes, which is personal bodyguard protection. Um, so we're gonna have the licensing options through the state of Texas on our website. That's 100% happening. Um, and we've added a store. We had an online store back in February. Um, and what we're gonna do is essentially make it to where when you go to our website, you can not only book and, and get your license through the state, you can book your, you know, any kind of licensing or any kind of training courses from LTC to firearm safety training, rifle training, those kind of things. But you can also hop on the store and purchase the firearms, equipment, accessories, whatever you need. Um, and we're setting up like a discount structure to where it's like, hey, if you purchase this training course, you get X amount off the store and vice versa. You purchase something from the store, you get, X amount off a training course or a licensing course, and um, we feel like that's going to be pretty heavy and 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 be uh, be really good for for what we're trying to do and and uh, we're trying to get more revenue that's not associated to a payroll cost, right? I mean that's everyone's biggest expense for the most part, especially in this business. Um, but if we can start having revenue dollars that come in that aren't exactly associated to a payroll cost. Um, you know that's 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 a good thing. So that's yeah. that's kind of the goal. And also with licensing, it's build ones. Exactly. Yeah. And then we just sit back and see how it goes. Yeah. And then so once we get um, everything complete, uh, the site should be up and rolling by July 1st at the latest. Nice. Once we give that, we're going to give that about 30 days, maybe 60, um, just kind of work all the kinks out, see how the payment structure goes, see how everything's kind of going, finalize our marketing strategy with it. Um, we're already working on um, when the time is, is good to go. To get our business license in multiple states uh, throughout the country that offer that we're only going to do it in states that offer online licensing like Texas does. Makes sense. So that way, what we so can you can do, build, you can launch the whole package exactly. instead of just. So that way, eventually, what we're trying to have is not only can you do this in Texas, but you can do it in multiple states and utilize us as a one-stop shop for the industry. You know, get your license in multiple states, buy your firearms, buy your equipment, get your training courses taken care of, and you know, be good to go. So nice. I like that. But I like I like ending every episode with the segment I do. Mm -hmm. So I asked previous guests for a last question. Mm -hmm. And so I have a question for you and then I'll ask you for a question mm -hmm. for a future guest. Mm -hmm. uh, your question is, where do you think Austin? What do you think Austin looks like in 2030? What industries have boomed? What have failed? And what's thriving in Austin? Okay, uh, I think in 2030 Austin's going to look a little different. I know, uh, I know a lot of construction that's coming up on six and thirty-five, and we're we're actually going to be a big part of it. Um, but I think I think Austin's going to look better. I think I think that's the best way to put it. Austin's going to look better in six years. Um, I think it's going to look it's going to look different. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a little bit more welcoming than it has been. Um, and uh, and yeah, I'm I'm excited to see how it is. And then what was the other one? What industries do you think will be thriving right. versus so, I think anything that doesn't uh, I got you. So, um, well, I, I think security will be thriving. <laughs> I think that's one, um, th hopefully. And uh, But, no, I think, um, I, I think the, the, the tech world, going into that space, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, that's an easy answer, yeah. right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and in this city, you know, the, you, you can see it. I mean, every office building is – full of a new startup tech company and this yeah. and that and so something in that realm obviously I think and I think it's going to spawn from here you know I think I think Austin's a great a great place for that to happen um, industries that I see possibly not being around or you know or maybe not not doing being as around well, but yeah. not doing as well um, man that's a tough one 
Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, uh, positions in the hospitality. I think that we're going to start seeing um, more AI and, and things yeah. taking certain jobs that um, have, you know, up to this point been, you know, people in them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think the hospitality side is is not as important anymore um, to some to, to a lot of people, right? Like it used to be where, um, you know, if you go to a restaurant and the valet didn't get your door or the, you know, the hostess wasn't friendly or whatever, you'd, you'd be like, what the fuck, you yeah. know? But now no, it's like everything's people, a touch screen. Now people don't yeah. care. You know, they're just like, yeah, I just want to sit down and eat. I don't want to eat, talk to anybody. You know, yeah. like um, that says a lot about just society. In general. Yeah, but I mean, it's true. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and so I I think unfortunately I think a lot of the positions in like hospitality and human interaction I think is 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 going to kind of slow down for sure. It's already doing it. Yeah. You know. So, what's your question for a future guest? Hmm, that's a good one. I guess I would say what's uh what's something that you feel like austin can take from other parts of the state to make austin better right like whether it's you know a vibe whether it's a certain you know yeah. uh, i think that i think that might be a good one okay. what what, like what, what aspects around the state could austin adapt or you know adopt essentially and uh to, to make austin a better you know i like that no, but thank you for coming on. It was a great conversation. Yeah. It was Where can fun. listeners find you? What do you want to plug? What can we link for you? Man, what uh, the, the, the easiest way to find us is on our website, uh, nxtlvlsecurity.com. From there, you can see the links to all of our other companies, our online store, our training courses, our social medias, um, and follow us all on there. So Nice, yeah. and we'll link everything, but thank you for coming on. Sounds good, man. I appreciate, I appreciate it. the time. Yeah, that was fun.